true believers, how is it going? Okay, um, so I've had this episode in mind for a pretty long time, and one of the reasons why it's taken so long is because while I was doing the usual thing, putting it off and um, being distracted by other things, I was still... more things about what this could cover kept occurring to me, and just um, some of the things that have even happened recently, uh, you know, made me see these see this from a different angle and say more things that could be incorporated into it. Originally, this was going to be just sort of a fairly... Um, focused thing, sort of just uh, really, again, focused on a, more or less a single thing, and now it's going to be a, a bit larger, and uh, the larger thing, of course, is, is Disney, and um, it, it's comic, uh, I guess, I guess, yeah, it's a contribution to comics and stuff like that, and, and the, the Disney comics that have existed for so long, and the ones that are out nowadays and stuff like that, and... Um, just because, again, because I've had a little more time to think of it about it, there, there were other things I thought I might want to say. So I don't really know how to do this. Um, I do it the same way as I always do. I try my best to... To me, historical context is everything, and especially how it relates to my own life, so a little history again. Because how I grew up and how I viewed something as big as Disney, I mean, let's face it, I mean, if you are somebody living in North America, or even most parts of the world, I imagine, Disney's had some sort of impact on your life. It's not something you could really ignore. I mean, if you weren't really into it, you weren't really into it, but I mean, it was a big, huge presence, and it's always getting bigger, and nowadays, you know, it's another thing where it's image and it shifts and changes. I mean, a few years ago, the last thing I really said about it, of course, was the big announcement that Disney had, in fact, bought Marvel, that now all of Marvel Comics belongs to Disney, which is still kind of mind-blowing when I think about it, and there was, you know, a big uproar, and a lot of people wondered what exactly this would mean for Marvel's direction as far as making comics goes, and, um, as they promised, it, it was it had a lot to do with, you know, getting in on the licensing and the marketing and, and all the products they could come out with now. And also, it, Disney got it, some of its stuff behind, you know, getting some more animated shows out there and things like that. And um, it, It's difficult to analyze that and say exactly how much of it has to do with Disney, how much of it has to do with Marvel itself. Uh, you know, you look at something like the Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon, which is sadly goofy as hell. And you say, is that Disney's influence, trying to make it just, you know, more fun, you know, for us, you know, a younger audience? Because at the end of the day, we want kids to like Spider-Man, even though he, in the comics, he can be a more of a grown-up hero. Um, I don't know, uh, you know, there's probably reading to be done and that sort of stuff. Already I've derailed myself. So, again, about myself, well, before myself even, I'll just say uh, some of the history of Disney, of course, how it came around. It, it was sort of, the, you know, the golden age of animation was sort of parallel to the golden age of comic books had a little bit of an earlier start, uh, maybe more in the early 30s than the late 30s, but you know what I'm talking about. And then um, the the full length feature anim animation you know movie was you know in North America at least it was Disney, and uh, it was really that was the only it really was the only company I think on the planet at the time that had the talent and the resources and the excuse me money behind it and all that stuff. You know, I think there were people in other parts of the world that may be just as talented, but they didn't have the resources behind them, you know. 1937, to come out with something like uh, the movie um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, which, you know, was a breathtaking achievement. And many of them, the Buffalo, you'd have to you'd have to consider them. I mean, Bambi. Bambi is such a gorgeous movie to think that, you know, pretty much everybody that had anything to do with that movie nowadays is dead, and probably long dead. It, it's incredible, uh, the pioneers in animation that they were and, and the achievements they made. But anyway... So, as I said, Disney, of course, has, you know, been around forever, and sometimes, at least for most of the time, has been looked to as the gold standard in Western animation. That has slipped now and again, and we're going to talk about that. Because, again, it's my age, uh, you know, I've talked about how old I am and, and how that impacts the way I've seen certain, uh, you know, things like comics and movies and such as they've come out the age I was at the time. And this has a lot to do with Disney, too. So, Disney, again, you know, big, wholesome family entertainment really dominated, especially in animation. Even in the even in the war years, in the 40s, when they couldn't really make full-length movies, when they did some of those mashups, um, they were still good, like the adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad, you know, it took The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, two, two shorts put together, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and uh, The Wind in the Willows, uh, there was the Three Amigos thing, um, and, and of course there were several others, before they got back to the full-length thing. Um, some beautiful movies in the 50s. Um, my favorite is, comes like at the end of the decade. It's still one of my all-time favorite animated films of Disney, which is Sleeping Beauty, which I own on DVD. Um, but anyway, so going even into the 60s again, you know, it was, it was a big thing, especially for households. 
in North America, you know. They had the wonderful World of Disney coming on, I guess, Sunday nights, like we still do. But it was sort of bigger than I think. And, um, of course, Walt Disney himself, he didn't live to be that old, really. He died. He died in 1966, and I think this was sort of the beginning of a bit of a decline of Disney not having, you know, its number one guy there. His older brother Roy, who of course co-founded Disney with him, would die several years later in 1971. And if you look at some of the, especially the animated movies at the time, I don't think there was necessarily a huge lapse in quality. The, uh, a couple from that era I really like, I really like the 1973 um, Robin Hood. That's still my favorite version of Robin Hood ever, <laughs> where everybody's animals and they're foxes. And then there's a few other things. The Aristocats was a few years earlier, and stuff like that. And then going to the 80s, the, uh, if you look at um, the 80s, uh, those films, again, the animated feature full lengths, a lot of them are sort of the more forgotten Disney films, and that's because they were no longer the huge box office draws they used to be. And, um, and you know, Fox and the Hound in 1981, uh, that marked sort of one of the prominent animators at the time. He'd been an animator throughout the 70s. His name is Don Bluth. I think he was upset with the direction Disney was going to, he thought they were getting away from the gold standard they had set, and this actually caused him to leave and found his own animation studio, and uh, I'm sure Don Bluth is a name that resounds with some of you because he would do his own animated movies that would come to rival the Disney ones. I feel like his early movies were very good, and then his later movies were some of the worst animated movies you could watch, something like Rockadoodle comes to mind. But I mean, his first was still one of my favorite ever, uh, 1982, is Secret of Nim. I love, love, love that movie. Love it to death. Uh, you know, and then there were several. There's The, the Land Before Dawn Time, which was, again, one of my earliest movie memories, and, and a few others. And they were really starting to um, rival Disney as far as scope and quality went. And this was a good thing, because this kicked off sort of what I wanted to talk about. Of course, it took a huge digression in intro, and that's just who I am. And I want to talk about a, a period that some people at least know, and it, it's called the, the Disney Renaissance. And uh, what Don Booth did partly fueled the Disney Renaissance. There were several things going on. The Disney Renaissance is understood to happen somewhere in the second half of the 80s, going into the early 90s, and it is exactly what it suggests, sort of a rebirth. Disney getting itself back on top again through, um, you know, just good work and, and good quality stuff. I mean, they did The Black Calder in a few years earlier, which... That movie has its merits. It's an interesting movie. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. But it just was not really the right thing for them to be doing. And, uh, and again, um, 1989's Little Mermaid was, you know, huge and really kicked off a, 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 a long stream of successive big animated movies that would come out every year. It's a little mixed up because in 1990, the next year was actually a sequel from one of their 70s movies, The Rescuers, would be The Rescuers Down Under, which certainly wasn't a bad film, but I don't really count it as part of that. Um, 1988, 1988 also had a, a really cool movie that I love and saw again recently for the first time in many years, and it, it's just an incredible movie, and, and that was Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which of course was more than Disney. You had Warner Brothers and all this other stuff into it, but if you look into all the legal stuff and everything, it really was Disney's show. Um, Steven Spielberg was one of the producers, and it just showed how much clout uh, Spielberg had back then, and must, I mean, even back then, I mean, he's the man now, he was the man then, too, because basically he got these other studios that have various animated properties, he basically just convinced them to loan the characters to him, like, um, you know, which of course is most significant in the, probably Disney's biggest rival, Warner Brothers, you know, you've got Mel Blanc in there doing uh, Daffy Duck and, and, and Bugs Bunny, and, and it's all there, and actually Warner Brothers isn't making any money off it. Only Disney is, with their characters. Everybody else, again, there's some others like Betty Boop and several other characters that came from separate studios, and they were all loaned. And it worked out well. It's a great movie. Um, I know that he was sort of new back then. A lot of people have a lot of opinions on Michael Eisner, can't get into him. And he was actually one of the doubters of the movie, thought because it was PG and edgy and had sexual innuendo and stuff like that, you know, it was too far. But I think maybe nowadays he realizes in retrospect that he's, he was wrong <laughs> because it's worked out so well. And one of the things it did was it really rekindled the love of the golden age of animation, and I think it was another thing that helped give Disney legs and helped spark the renaissance. Why am I saying all this? Because, again, my age. So I grew up basically just as the Disney renaissance really got going. So Disney became a huge presence in my life. I only have one picture here with me of myself that I've ever kept, um, like in a frame or anything. It's not my graduation photo or anything like that. It's a photo from many years ago. This is me in the summer of 1988 and uh, I hope you can see it well. And it's me in Disney World in Florida. And uh, that's me meeting Pluto. That's my hat on his nose. I'm not really sure how well you can see this. I'm not used to bringing stuff this close to the camera. But hopefully you can see the look of 
you know, joy and innocent wonder and stuff on my face because I'm really happy. And I guess that's one of the main reason I always thought this photo was significant and wanted to keep it because um, it's just a, you know, it's not a smile for the camera moment. It's simply, you know, a kid who is just happy. And there it is, captured well, and it's because of Disney. So that's the one thing. I would go to Disney World three times in a span of four years back then, and it was huge and it meant a lot to me. So also part of the Disney Renaissance was, you know, they started to expand into other things, and DuckTales. DuckTales was huge for me. And, uh, you know, I, I used to watch that cartoon a lot, and it's one of the ones that really holds up. Like, you can revisit it as an adult, and, well, of course, it's, you know, it's still kidsy and stuff like that. Um, it had some very clever writing and just, you know, fun adventure stuff. It was a great adventure of the week type thing. It was great watching Scrooge McDuck, who I think is one of the greatest Disney characters of all time, um, who'd actually been introduced first in comics, which is where we're getting from. And um, uh, another show that spun off from that was Darkwing Duck, which was great because then now you took... It was sort of like a comic booky thing. It was a spin-off. It was set in the same u Disney universe as... Uh, as um, DuckTales, except, except it was sort of like the sister city to Duckburg. This was St. Canard, which is obviously a little bit based on Gotham City. And then you have, again, this is another great show that I watched as part of the Disney afternoon in the early 90s. I think Darkwing Duck ran from 91 to 95. And I used to watch it all the time. Another great show that totally holds up. I'll probably buy it someday. Very clever show, a lot of fun, and it plays with a lot of superhero tropes. And some of the crossover stuff is great, too, because, again, you've got, you know, Darkwing Duck sort of as Batman and and DuckTales as Gizmo Duck as, you know, Superman. And it really plays at the fun between their relationship, you know, the dark brooding guy and the, the big smiling Boy Scout that everybody loves. And again, just a, a great show that I really love. So what I want to talk about, again, comic-wise, was something not done by Carl Barks. Now Carl Barks is one of the biggest names in comics that a lot of people don't really know. Um, but it is just as big as somebody like, I remember I talked about Jack Kirby, this is another one of the Giants, right up there with Jack Kirby and Will Eisner. And Carl Barks basically exclusively, um, from like the 30s on, from decades, would draw, you know, Disney comics, mostly in sort of the DuckTales universe. Well, the DuckTales universe didn't exist yet, but I, well, this is what started. DuckTales basically comes from that. The Avengers is Hugh, Dewey, and Louie, and their uncle Scrooge, obviously based on Ebenezer Scrooge to a certain extent. Now what this is, is The Life and Times of Scrooge McDuck by Don Rosa. Don Rosa is some is what some people in the business might call an ascended fanboy. He was like, he loved, you know, Carl Barks, loved his comics, which again, ran for decades, were gorgeous and beautiful, just so clean and such a great style um, to do another digression. Um, people sometimes who aren't don't know much about manga or anime, especially if they look at earlier stuff, they'll say, why is it that all these, you know, even going back to like the 40s and 50s, why is it that all these Japanese artists um, drew uh, a lot of their characters, you know, like Caucasian and stuff like that? Why did they have that style? It was because um, after Japan lost World War II and it was occupied heavily by, you know, a, a, a large contingent of American uh, military forces and stuff like that, a lot of the Americans that lived over there and stuff brought things with them, and among them they brought comics, and a lot of these were the comics of somebody like Karl Barks. And somebody like Osama Tezuka based his drawing style directly off Karl Barks, so it's a, you can see how they influenced them, and, and it's just gone down through the decades. Uh, so I think that's huge. So again, you can never overlook the contributions of somebody like Karl Barks. He passed away quite a while ago, but his legend lives on. And um, you can still get, of course, uh, Scrooge McDuck comics. But the thing here with Don Rosa, this is this is Volume One. I don't have Volume Two yet. I, for a while, I hemmed and hawed about whether I should try to talk about this since I don't have the whole thing. The idea was, this is an episodic thing that's uh, that uh, Dan Rosa Dan Rosa took Don Rosa took for himself. The idea was he would go back through all the comics that um, Karl Barks had written with uh, Scrooge. And Scrooge would often make reference, you know, to his past, especially like growing up and how it was he won his fortune and stuff like that. You know, he talked about his time in the Klondike and stuff like that. And Don Rosa, just sort of for the fun of it, tried his best to take all the th stuff he could find and actually create a real timeline for it with real dates. The idea being that Scrooge was born, I think, in the late 1860s, and he would die... Uh, I think at the age of a uh, 100 in you know the 1960s or stuff like that after a life full of adventure. And so this would take him and it'd be episodic. And uh, there's six parts here. And 
I'm sure Don Rosa has his own style, but if you're used to Karl Barks' stuff, it looks very much like that. Anyway, it's just it's and it's just something that I'm really glad to have. It's by Kaboom Comics, sometimes just known as Boom. They do the Disney stuff. They're pro I guess they're owned by Disney. And um, it's just it's just fun, clever stuff and really good adventure fare. And I don't have the second half yet, but I will get this. This also has a companion book you can get, which I suppose shows a lot of those references in the Karl Barks comics. And um, it's just, I think, it's, if you're into comics, it's, and um, for some people at least, especially, again, if you're doing the whole superhero thing, it's easy to forget how, if you're tracing back roots where some things come from. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not doing a good job of explaining myself, but again, it's easy, I don't think the average person knows that a character like Scrooge McDuck actually was created originally in comics and had a life in comics only for decades before actually finding his way into anything animated. Um, again, if you watch the DuckTales show, a lot of that, the ideas from that come from a lot of Karl Barks comics. He wasn't the only guy doing those, but he was the guy. And he's a member of uh, one of the Comic Book Hall of Fames. In fact, he was an inaugural member in the, well, the 87, or I think it was, with the two, other two I mentioned, uh, Will Eisner <clears throat> and uh, Jack Kirby. An amazing writer and artist, an amazing creator who's, you know, again, his, uh, his style, his his imagination, his innovation, you know, continues on well after his death and has influenced not just one generation of artists, but probably several. And again, I think what's coolest about that is how he inadvertently influenced what will become manga over in Japan. So, I'm not going to review this, I, you know, I don't really do reviews, but I mean, I cannot wait to get the second half of this Eisner Award winning. Yeah, this came out in 1995, by the way. And speaking of that, this is something that's a little more recent. Uh, as I said, I did watch the Darkwing Duck cartoon and really liked it, but I hadn't seen it in many years and forgot a lot of it. And this is um, another Kaboom thing, and it is done by... Who is the writer on this? Writer Ian Brill and artist James Silvani. And this is... Uh, it just says Disney's Darkwing Duck on this, but this is a four-issue collection called The Duck Knight Returns, and you'll see the, obviously, the little Frank Miller nod in there. And it's sort of, and it, and it sort of is a send-up of the whole Dark Knight Returns things, of course, but set in the Darkwing Duck universe. Um, things are condensed. The idea simply is that Darkwing Duck has only been retired for, say, about a year. And one of the running jokes is, even though it's only been a little over a year, most of the people in the city already kind of forget him and can't remember his name and stuff. And the backdrop of this story is that there's this huge corporation that almost everybody works for, including Drake Mallard himself, and some of the retired villains that he used to fight against, like Megavolt. Now they're all simply employees of this strange, shadowy corporation that nobody really understands what anybody, you know, what it actually does. Nobody knows who, like, the head of it is or anything like that. And, of course, as that goes forward. So there's a lot of fun, you know, fun social commentary in here about the drudgery of that sort of life, kind of an office space type thing, but with the whole Darkwing Duck thing really intact. What's great about it is um, it sort of picked, uh, yeah, it, there really was no Darkwing Duck material after the show ended in 95. So basically, if you were familiar with the show, you can just, you know, watch that and be like, and here's what happens a year later. This isn't, uh, th there's, there is a sequel to this that I can't wait to get. This has some, something of a cliffhanger ending. But um, it just has beautiful, colorful art, um, you know, fit, you know, exactly from the show, basically. Um... There's a great intro, or not an intro, there's a great um, afterward here that talked about the creation of the Darkwing Duck character. There was some good stuff in there that I wish I could remember. Actually, I know that the man, yeah, Alan Burnett, he was the man that came up with the name. They, they had the idea of at first doing a secret agent duck, and then they changed it to um, a superhero duck. And they had sort of a contest within the offices to see who could come up with the name. The man who came up with the name Darkwing was Alan Burnett. Alan Burnett did not actually stay with um, the, the studio to, to work on the show. He went over to Warner Brothers and would work with uh, Bruce Timm for the Batman animated series, my favorite show of all time. Okay, uh, I did gloss over and skip over a few things. One of the other things that was about, you know, growing up as a kid, again, the late 80s and into the 90s, and how much Disney had an effect on my life. These weren't mine, but I have them for now. These were always my sister. She was three years older than me. And this is a magazine I hope some of you might remember called Disney Adventures. And it was a, a, a really cool, you know, uh, paperback-sized magazine just all about sort of, you know, aimed at kids, full of pop culture stuff. Uh, as you see, there's Jason Priestley on the cover. All the covers would have, you know, probably some celebrity of the day with some Disney characters on there. And, you know, it was cool. It had, like, scientific little things. Here's a thing, you know, swimming with sharks and stuff like that, you know. 
it, it was just a really good thing, you know, if you think of any kids' magazine, it, it was sort of that idea, there was stuff about science, but the other thing that I really liked about it was that it actually had its own comics. And here is a Darkwing Duck comic, and there would be Darkwing Duck, there would be DuckTales, there would be, uh, again, stuff from the Disney Afternoon, like, um, Tailspin. Uh, most, uh, only the earliest comics actually gave credit to who the writers and uh, artists were. A lot of them it just wouldn't say. But one thing, again, nothing, a name that wouldn't have meant anything to me at the time, and I was just a kid reading this, but um, if you look at the masthead, the, the comics editor of Disney Adventures was Marv Wolfman. So, you know, that's one of the things that you're like, well, that makes perfect sense, of course, and it's really cool. And again, just really great comics going on in here. Um, most of them were just sort of standalone stuff, but there was a thing called The Legend of the Chaos God that was, I think, in five parts and linked them all together. It linked, um, again, it linked Goof Troop to Darkwing Duck to Tailspin, just following a thing. You can find, if, um, you can actually find it online to read. It's a pretty short read for something that's five parts, because again, they're small parts, but it's really cool and it's just sort of a unique thing in comics that, uh, you know, I can't really think of a, a parallel for. But, uh, some of the other covers I just thought I, I had many, many of them. Um, I think it's almost a complete run, almost. At least, uh, I, I know that they did go beyond the 19... Uh, we have it up till 1996, anyway. We don't have some of the earliest ones, but here's one of the early... Here are a couple of early ones, you know, with their completely typical... There's, you know, Macaulay Culkin with, um, uh, the sea witch from Mermaid, Ursula. And <laughs> there's Paula Abdul somehow on the cover by herself, which is weird, because, like, again, the thing was always they had people with them. They, but this is early, December 91, maybe they just didn't have it. Um, I have one that has Arnold Schwarzenegger on it, and there's, and there's actually nobody with him. You get the feeling, it's like, this is serious, no cartoon, but there's like something, I'm sorry for that terrible impression, but there's somebody up in the corner. But I wanted to show you one particular one, because, you know, the term hilarious in hindsight, uh, I cannot actually think of it. This is June 93, and I won't even say anything when I show it to you, because I cannot think of a better example. This, honestly, even in June 93, this would have been funny. But nowadays, it's, it is fucking hilarious, and I won't even say words. But check that out. Yeah, that happened. Yeah, too easy. <clears throat> So, I didn't, you know, get into really reviewing anything exactly, but again, I never do that anyway. It was just more to talk about the impact Disney has and will continue to have. Oh, yeah, the other thing that I, was going to occur to me, of course, is that Disney's next upcoming animated feature will draw on Marvel, but in probably the least offensive way possible. Apparently, ever since Marvel was acquired by Disney, they were, you know, um, Disney people were encouraged to, you know, look through Marvel's you know, catalog or whatever, to find properties that might make good adaptations. And what's good about what's coming up, it, it's a thing called Big Hero 6. It's coming, it's going to be Disney's next big animated feature, computer animated, which I guess is okay, coming out this November. And Big Hero 6 is sort of an obscure thing in Marvel, and this is why it works so well. But again, in Marvel, Big Hero 6 came out in 1998, and I think it was sort of the idea of taking the whole idea of, you know, Alpha Flight, you know, Canada's own super team, and just doing that again with Japan. So it took, you know, some of the actual characters, of course, the more prevalent ones, um, you know, uh, the Japanese X-Men, Sunfire, and also the sometimes villain Silver Samurai, and they were, uh, they were brought together by the Japanese government with several other characters that were created just for this team, and it was called Big Hero 6. And I think the idea at the time, and it did have its own little limited series, this is 1998, by the way, uh, not really a great time for Marvel. One of those things that would definitely slip through the cracks. And I'm not even saying it was great, I never read them, but they look cool. But I think the whole idea was uh, the artist and writer responsible, who I can't think of, but I will, you know, look it up to, to so you can find out. I think the idea was, you know, they wanted to do something manga-esque, you know, and sort of play around with some of that stuff and be like, ah, oh, you know, the, it's used to, you know, draw like Tokyo and stuff and have Japanese pop culture thrown in. And, you know, again, just sort of do a manga thing. So what they're doing is, um... They're just taking the basic idea for that. They're not, they're not saying this is set in the Marvel Universe. Um, it's not really going to be Sunfire. They're just going to make somebody else. There's going to be like a robot involved again. So that's the idea. It's actually not even going to be set in Tokyo. It's going to be set in a fictional place. I think it's called San Francisco, you know, San Francisco combined with Tokyo. And, that's, and uh, if you go to Disney's uh, YouTube page for their animation, that's the first thing that I saw that let me know about this before I went reading more. And the, all it is is just a, a shot of the city 
and it's exactly what you'd expect, you know? It, it looks like Tokyo with all its neon signs, but it's got the hills, and it's got the bridge, just like, you know, San Francisco, and it actually follows one of San Francisco's uh, streetcars. So, uh, anyway, I think it's probably a really good idea, and sort of the least offensive thing Disney could do, because I think when Disney purchased Marvel, again, a lot of people were worried that it's going to be like, Disney presents Spider-Man, and God knows what they'll do with it. But no, you know, this is not the Marvel Universe. It's simply an idea from the Marvel Universe, adapted somewhat loosely, which I think is cool, and I am really looking forward to seeing more about it. So, I guess that will wrap it up. Uh, again, just to sum it up, um, you know, Disney, of course, has done great things and done stupid things, and um, I don't know where they're at now. I'd say the Renaissance, that Renaissance wore off sometime around 1996, but you did have a really great, great string in the first half of the 90s, at least. Um, you know, Pixar picks things up in 95, and, the, you know, they'd run with a while. And Pixar, of course, is part of Disney. But I've got <laughs> dozens of these Disney adventures that I just love to... I just love to read through again for all the wonderful 90s nostalgia and stuff like that. Oh, oh there's Arnold. See, Arnold pumps you up. And um, it was a really great magazine, and I'm really glad that my sisters let me hold on to these copies. They were at our parents' house for a long time, so I just said, do you mind if I have them instead of them sitting there? So they're still technically hers, but I get to have them for the foreseeable future, which is awesome. Okay, so I don't know how concise an episode that was. It was just more like bringing up some stuff about Disney, but it, it just felt important, and it still feels important, you know, going forward, doing a comic book channel, to... Uh, to recognize Disney's contribution to comics as far back as pretty much the beginning and how it continues on now. And some of the stuff, again, that I wouldn't have been aware of at the time, like Marv Wolfman working with Disney Adventures and, you know, helping them do the comics and stuff like that. So that's just a great thing to me. And um, I don't know, this is an episode that I really wanted to do. Didn't have the clearest idea on how to do it. Maybe sort of made a mess of it. But um, next time we'll do something more focused, maybe just a graphic novel or something like that. And um, anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Peace out, you guys, and I'll see you guys later. Bye.